All right. Thank you for joining us for our A20 TX and A20 Nexus Go presentation. Here's Gary and Paul. Good morning. Thank you for joining us, everybody. I'm Paul Isaacs, a Director of Product Design at Sound Devices, and this is Gary. Hi, I'm Gary Trenda. <laughs> I'm a RF Applications Engineer at Sound Devices. Yeah, thanks for joining us this morning, everybody. We're sort of like really excited to be able to chat to you about our two new um, wireless products that are part of the Astral range of wireless products from Sound Devices. Um, we're going to be talking about uh, the A20 TX, which is this baby here. It's a body-worn transmitter. And we're also going to be talking to you about our new multi-channel receiver, the A20 Nexus Go, which is sitting atop my H33 right now. So yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, yeah, we're super excited. Let's talk about the A20 TX first. Um, this is an extremely versatile body-worn transmitter, which is suitable for many types of applications, uh, whether it's for film and TV uh, type production, reality show production, and really many other broadcast type applications and event type applications. Um, some of the key features I want to go over with you right now. Um, it does use our uh, SpectraBand technology, which some of you may be familiar with now. This is a, a, a key characteristic of all our Astral product, uh, wireless product. So SpectraBand refers to the fact that we have an ultra wide band of operation within the transmitter and the receiver. And um, we've actually extended SpectraBand uh, beyond what was available in with just our A20 Mini. So the A20 TX supports all the way from 169 megahertz up to 1525 megahertz. Um, previously, it was 470 megahertz to one. Uh, to 1525. So we've added support for the VHF range, which is going to be really, it's handy to have that in situations where your UHF spectrum is really, really, really crowded and you've got nowhere else to go. I mean, this is probably going to be pretty unlikely in, in sort of like normal circumstances, but just knowing you've got VHF available to you as well is just a really nice confidence booster that you've got this ex, uh, this extended part of the spectrum to operate in. So the A20 TX supports that. And the A20 Nexus and the Nexus Go and our A20 RX will all be supporting that extended spectra band range as well. Now, the advantage of spectra band, obviously, because you've got all of this um, spectrum of available Available to, available to you in one piece of hardware, you can literally go anywhere in the world and know you're going to find some clean spectrum to operate in. You don't need to worry about having multiple SKUs of transmitter or receiver with you um, to be confident that you're going to have be able to find some space. It's all in the same bit of hardware. Have you got anything to add to that, Gary? Yeah, I mean, with VHF, a uh, couple of things you want to think about. It is a much lower frequency than what you're maybe used to operating with if you're in the UHF TV band. So it's going to be different antennas. And so we do have those antennas available as an accessory. So think about switching antennas when you go to the VHF band. And yeah, as you said, it's uh, good to have a lot of different options, especially when you're in crowded spectrum. So mm -hmm. having VHF in addition to all the UHF band and all the way up to one, over 1.5 gigahertz is really an unrivaled tuning range. Right. Uh, we've get, gotten some questions about the A20 Mini, uh, and I will say the A20 Mini hardware starts at 470 megahertz. So the A20 TX is going to be your option for VHF in our Astral series at this point. Right, great. Thanks, Gary. So let's talk about um, some of the capabilities of this in terms of audio, because this transmitter supports more audio input types than any other transmitter we know of on the market today. So of course it supports standard two wire or three wire lav mics, but it also supports any, almost any balanced input source. So we're talking about balanced mic inputs, balanced line inputs, uh, 
balanced mic with phantom uh, 48 or phantom 12 volt sources so this makes an ideal solution for um, any boom type application um, it also supports aes 42 digital mics such as the shirt super seam it here so yeah we can take the two channels from this microphone the unprocessed and the processed channel and basically choose which one we transmit either the the unprocessed or the processed and we um, can supply the phantom volts required by this microphone to power it so yes supports aes 42 sources and it also supports aes 3 digital sources as well so all of those are, are mic uh, are balance type sources and in addition to that we also have a guitar input as well um, so we provide the necessary sort of guitar cables if you want to work with that yeah so one thing we want to talk about uh, lav mics it's a two pin or a three pin limo yep. little lav uh, as you said aes 42 with the power for aes 42 aes3 uh, and then I think the last thing we want to talk about is just that with the AS sources we're selecting, right? Which, yeah. which of the channels yeah. we want to send across the wireless link. Uh, we are aware of some requests to record both channels and that's something we're looking into. Yeah, sure. Okay, so that's the input types. Let's talk about um, the powering capability, uh, how this is, unit is powered. So this can almost operate with any battery type chemistry. So um, you have um, your stat, you can power this from three um, alkaline batteries or three nickel metal hydride batteries or three um, energizer ultimate lithium primaries. Um, but you can also power this from uh, rechargeable style batteries such as uh, lithium phosphor, um, batteries or lithium ion rechargeable batteries. Now those batteries have like a 3.2 or, or 3.7 volt output. Um, the really nice thing about when you're using these higher voltage batteries, the lithium ion or the lithium, lithium phosphor batteries, is that you can use either one, two or three of those batteries. So if you want to run with a slightly lighter weight transmitter, you can. Yes, yeah, so kind now, of recapping really quickly, you've got all of the battery types that you're used to. So you could use a uh, lithium primary cell, which is a 1.5 volt AA size battery. You could use a uh, nickel metal hydride, like any loops are a popular brand of nickel metal hydride battery. That's a 1.2 volt. You could use a uh, lithium ion cell, which you'd want a 3.7 volt lithium ion cell. Those are typically called a 14500. That's also a AA size battery. And then as you mentioned, uh, lithium iron phosphate, which is a 3.2 volt cell. Uh, you can also get those in a 14500 right. AA size. Yeah. Uh, the advantage to the higher than three volt cells, and uh, as you said, you can run on less than three if you need to, uh, which can provide you just some you know, redundancy there. Or if you are very concerned with weight, you could run on two batteries instead of three. Uh, it also allows you to recharge the batteries while they're in the A20TX. Uh, we've, got a, USB -C port. we've got a USB-C port on A20TX, similar to how we had on A20 Mini. So you're able to recharge those batteries in the unit. If you've got the 1.5 volt or so, 1.2 volt batteries, all those would need to be charged externally on the A20 Mini. But basically, any common chemistry that's available in a AA or a 14500 size battery, we're going to support in this unit, which is right. something our users really have been asking for. They want some choices in terms of what batteries they use. Uh, lithium iron phosphate is a good example there where you can get a very large number of charge cycles, like sometimes 10 times as many charge cycles out of a lithium iron phosphate as you would with a lithium ion. So yep. people who are concerned with going green with their systems, uh, that's a good choice for a rechargeable battery. Yeah, there's a really good, we've put a really good write-up of the different battery chemistries and their, and their benefits in the user guide. So if you want to know more detail about that, please refer to the user guide online. One thing I'll very quickly say in terms of battery runtime, Obviously, there's many variables that affect that, but uh, you can get up to 12 hours of runtime with this transmitter, depending on RF power, depending on the battery chemistry type, depending on the input source type, but up to 12 hours. 
Yeah. Um, and we've also gotten some questions about like what on average, and I would say in general, almost any of these combinations, if you're running three batteries with a lav mic, you're going to get seven hours. And so you're going to for sure make it to lunch on a set yeah. of batteries. And so, on that subject, um, that's continuous, right? Continuous operation. Right. If you're turning on and off, you can get far more, but some people are just concerned about running out of batteries right. in you know, four and, hours or something like that. Yeah. So that brings us onto the subject of actually powering on and off because for, in terms of most sort of, uh, other manufacturers' products, turning on and off transmitters during the course of a production is not the easiest thing to do. But with the Astral family products, with the A20 Nexus and the A20 Nexus Go and our transmitters, the A20TX and the A20 Mini, we also have this, we ha have this great uh, remote control from the receiver back to the transmitter, which allows it to very easily and quickly be t be t uh, allow the transmitter to be turned off over great long distance. And we've designed this, this remote control, which we call Nexlink, to have a much greater range than the actual forward audio link from the actual transmitter back to the receiver. So you know that you can always, no matter what the range, turn off those transmitters. And that's called Nexlink. And Nexlink allows us to really make any setting from the receiver not just power on and off, but we can change frequency, change RF power levels. We can configure, the, uh, we can name the transmitters, uh, many, many things we can do there. So that's another benefit of the A20TX. Um, so let's talk a little bit about the actual um, quality of the audio as well. I mean, look, look, we're gonna get onto the subject of gain forward, which is a technology which we really released over a year ago now with the A20 Mini. And really Gain Forward is the name we give to the fact that you no longer need to adjust gain on the actual transmitter. Um, you know, if the uh, talent is like really shouting and then going very quickly to a whisper, you don't need to be concerned about increasing or decreasing the gain on your transmitter. You can do it all further downstream directly from your mixer or recorder. Um, so it makes it much easier to in, in the workflow. And that's made possible by the fact that we have a really wide dynamic range mic preamp on the A20TX and the A20 Mini. Um, the dynamic range is so wide it can accommodate, it's much wider than any lav mic or uh, or, or mic source uh, available. So for instance, with uh, a lav, you're typically looking at around 110 dBs of dynamic range. Our lav mic input is around 130 dBs, okay? With um, a balanced mic source, so um, if you're using this with like a Sennheiser Boom 416 or something like this, or any, any balanced mic source, we have a dynamic range of about 140 dB. It's actually, when you're, when you're using a balanced mic source, it's using the same preamp that we have on our eight series mixer recorders. So really high quality. Um, anything to add to that, Gary? Sure, so gain forward, as you mentioned, first bit of it is a very <coughs> high quality, very high dynamic range preamp. Uh, then once we've sent the signal across the digital link, when you come out of your receiver, uh, in the case where we have a Nexus Go here connected to an 833, there's gonna be a digital connection between there which has an equivalent dynamic range or actually a bit wider dynamic range still. So the reason we call it gain forward is when you're digital all the way through your system, the first place that you're gonna adjust the gain is on the trim on your mixer. Uh, and that would also be true if you came out of a receiver like a Nexus or a Nexus Go with an AES-3 digital output because AES-3 has a 144.5 dB of dynamic range. As you mentioned, the mic pre is 140. So we have that entire dynamic range downstream. It's a digital signal, so that means that we're not going to have any noise penalty adjusting the gain either at the receiver or at the mixer recorder. So as you go into the mixer recorder, that's the first place you're going to adjust your gain, yeah. gain forward. Uh, and you get the benefits of gain forward, obviously, with the 8 series, but you can get it with any sort of third-party mixer recorder. Um, as long as that the signal remains in the digital domain the whole way through and you can apply the digital gain at the mixer side. Okay, so 
that's a little bit about the quality of the mic preamp. I'd like to talk you through some of the, the, the interface now because this there's some really cool aspects to this. So let's take a look here. Um, and you can see, uh, I'm just going to bring this a bit closer here, that we have this wonderful display here. This is an e-paper display. And um, it's really uh, low power, uh, virtually draws negligible power, and it's visible in the brightest sunlight from sort of any angle with light shining right down on it. So it's really to use in those super bright conditions. Um, but another really nice benefit of this e-paper display is that when you turn it off, and we're going to just demonstrate this now. Um, so it turns off. That information persists. So information such as the name of the transmitter, the frequency it is operating on and battery level. And this <laughs> makes it really easy to manage your your inventory of transmitters uh, when you're setting up a morning, knowing which transmitter is which. Uh, it's a really nice benefit of that e-paper display, don't you think, Gary? Yeah, I really oh. like it. I mean, it saves you from putting tape on all of your different transmitters just to maintain your labeling. Uh, it's nice to be able to swap batteries and just as soon as you put the batteries in and fire it up, yeah. you know exactly what's going on. No sticky gunk to clean off your <laughs> transmitters. <laughs> right. Um, anyway, so this is, I've just turned the, the transmitter back on again. But let's take a look around. You can see, so we've got this wonderful display here. And then either side, we have two LEDs. Um, one's predominantly showing your battery level. You know, green is healthy. <laughs> Orange is like medium amount of runtime left. And then when that goes red, it's giving you a warning that, OK, your batteries are starting to get to a sort of low level. You might want to start thinking about changing about your batteries. We do give you plenty of time. So you know, when you see that red light, you don't have to quickly drop everything. You've definitely got um, a, a reasonable amount of per a period of time to change those batteries. Um, it's probably worth mentioning the uh, e-ink display is uh, sunlight readable and then there's also a backlight on the e-ink display so if you are in a dark environment as soon as you open the door it's going it to light is. the display up for you. Yeah. So um, so that's your um, yeah predominantly your battery level and you actually got that duplicated on the top panel as well. Uh, and just to let you know, while we're talking about LEDs, you have the ability to um, determine whether you show no LEDs if you want to be in a sort of stealth mode where you don't want bright LEDs to be shining on camera or under clothing. So you can turn all of these LEDs off if you want and you still see battery level in the display just here. So, um, uh, But you can choose to turn off just the front panel LEDs or just the top panel LEDs or both or to have them all on. So you've got that flexibility. There are also some good options with the e-ink display. You can invert the coloring. So if you want a black background or a white background, uh, and you can also flip the display upside down depending yeah. on how you have the transmitter let's, mounted. Let's just quickly demonstrate that from here. So yeah. display background coming in here. I'm setting that to dark and you can see it's now flipped, inverted. And it's nice that you're setting this from the Nexus. So. Yeah, I could yeah. do it all from the menu, which I'm going to walk you through in a minute. Um, so, so you can see things and you've also got a flip function here too. All right, so uh, this LED on the right, you might see that it's sort of fading in and out as I talk. So that's your audio level. Um, also indicates your whether your unit is uh, synced to time code. Uh, then on the top panel, we have, as I said, you've got these two LEDs just here, one here, which is your power level. And then this LED here, um, because the A20TX is also has the ability to record, this uh, gives an indication of uh, whether you're recording or whether you're in, your audio is muted and various other statuses. Yeah, so for our international customers, do you want to talk a little bit about the recording feature, a micro SD card? And sure, so go on? ahead. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so we've got, uh, there is the ability to record internally on the uh, A20 transmitter. Uh, inside there, if you, Paul, if you want to open up the battery door, in fact, since you're running the lithium-ion batteries, you can just pull the first battery and right. show them. Inside there, there is a, a removable micro SD card. And so if you'd like, you right, can... So I don't yeah, know if you can see that might, very clearly might, might from be tough here. To see, There's a it's, slot hidden right there. It's, um, yeah, it's just there, and you just press it, and it comes out. Yeah. 
There's also the USB-C port that we talked about before. So if you were to plug this into your computer with a USB-C cable, it'll mount just like USB flash drive and that memory will be accessible through that USB-C port. So you've got a couple of different ways that you can pull that memory, the uh, audio files off of the memory card. Uh, as far as recording, it's the same as A20 Mini. It's a 48K 32-bit float wave file that gets recorded. Right. right one thing, one Im important thing to mention is if you're using this sort of like for reality type productions where you're you're wanting to leave your transmitter recording all day, you know, you can end up with quite big file sizes. So we recommend that you, um, in that case, you want to use a 64 gigabyte card or higher because 64 gigabyte cards can be formatted XFAT, which doesn't have a four gigabyte limitation. Whereas FAT32, which are 32 gigabyte cards and less, have that four gigabyte limit. It's a limitation of the actual FAT32 format. So if you want to do long recording, stick a 64 gig micro SD card in there, format it in the unit, and then you'll be able to pretty much run for almost 80 hours or 90 hours nonstop without yeah. it. You need some sort of external <laughs> powering option for that. But that's I a mean, good tip. You know, these reality shows are getting <laughs> sort of like pretty much 24 seven these days. True, so. right. All right, so um, that's um, your recording app. So let's take a closer look at the menu here. We've gone over the LEDs and the various um, we can talk about accessories in, in a minute, okay? Sure, yeah. But yeah, so when you open the door, as Gary said just now, the backlight comes on so you can see what you're doing. But you'll also see that this menu icon appears in the bottom of the screen. And notice also, you have you know, I, I've got these buttons below the battery and I, I can use these as shortcuts to, um, to go to, um, for instance, here it shows RF power, two milliwatts, and it's telling me that we're using standard modulation right now. So if I want to change the RF power quick, I can jump directly to that menu and then use the up and down arrows to, um, you know, select whichever RF power I want. All right. And then whenever you close the door, you notice that it automatically jumps back to the main home screen there. And likewise, if I want to change the battery chemistry, right now I'm running with lithium ion, but maybe I stuck in lithium ion phosphor batteries, I could just press that and it'll take me directly to the battery type menu where I can select the chemistry. And that's important if you want the green, orange and red battery remaining indicators to come on at the correct uh, voltage level. So again, Paul, can you talk a little bit about the haptic feedback when you're going through the menus and then maybe also talk a little bit about just the case of the A20TX okay. and the materials? So yeah, whenever you press a button, you actually there's um, you actually feel um, some like vibration. It's a little like vibration to yeah. make so you know that you've actually pressed the, the button and it makes it much pretty easy to uh, operate even when you're not looking at it. You know, you, when you get the muscle memory of where you want to go in the menu that right. could be helpful in that sense yeah and then the the case on it we've, is mainly a, a metal case there's a plastic top and bottom the bottom's uh, plastic for an, a 2.4 gig antenna for your next link and then on the top we've got a uh, plastic uh, cover so that we can have a magnetic sensor for uh, oh, yeah. a switch so let's talk about the toggle switch that can go on this yeah so as you can see we've got this uh, comparing it to a standard unit. Oops, let's get rid of that here. But you can see that on this unit here, we have this switch. It's a optional switch which you can purchase, and this can be essentially very easily installed on a unit um, simply by removing the two top screws here and here, and then um, mounting this on top, and then screwing this directly on. There's no actual uh, multi-pin connector. It's all communicating via a magnetic sensor. And this, notice that the switch is a physically latching switch and it's sprung loaded. So it sort of latches into position. Hold it all right, there, so okay, that. you got that? Okay, so you can see it springs back when it's off and then you can, it requires quite a positive action to um, uh, turn it on and a quite a positive action to turn it off. So it's very unlikely that it's going to accidentally change state. The nice thing about this switch is it can be programmed to several different functions. It can be used, as you can see right now, it's programmed to turn the transmitter on or off. 
and it can also be used to toggle the audio mute uh, to stop and start recording. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty pretty neat feature there. Okay. Anything else on that? No, I think uh, we're, we're probably coming to the end of our A20TX time, but if you wanted right. to talk briefly about privacy keys, uh, I right, think that's yeah. one thing that we haven't talked about yet. So yeah, with the A20TX system, uh, the whole Astral system now, we've now included privacy to prevent um, anyone inadvertently or trying to hack into your uh, production and your audio coming from your wireless. Now, obviously, for especially for sort of some high level corporate type applications, it's very important to those companies that the audio is, is secure. Um, so we've added privacy to the A20TX and actually also via firmware update to the A20 Mini 2. And um, the, the really nice thing is when you're using this with the A20 Nexus is that you can set your privacy here and you can get it to generate a new key or you can manually set a key and that will be sent to any to the next linked transmitter over over wireless so you only need to set it in one place yeah and the important point here is in order to decode the audio coming from the a20 mini or a20 tx you need to have a matching four digit privacy key uh, but if you're in a situation where you need multiple receivers you can manually enter that privacy key into your additional receivers and so as long as all these keys match you can have a single transmitter with multiple receivers yeah and notice what happens on the front panel here of the transmitter when privacy is engaged. You get this little key icon above the battery icon right there. Okay, so I think we've covered the majority of the functions of the A20TX. There's a lot more in it. You know, if I I'm, I'm not going to go into any of these, but you can see when you access the menu, if you can switch to the screen here. Um, yeah, you can see that when you press that, uh, menu icon there's all these different menus that you can scroll through you know this is where you can select your input type um, and then it's very easy to navigate record menu mode whether you want to do record only or rf only etc privacy various other settings including battery setup leds display uh, when you want to pair the transmitter to your um, to your uh, a20 remote app and just very very quickly now the A20TX is also compatible with the A20 Remote app, which is the app that's also used to control the A20 Mini. All right, well, we'll leave it there. Yeah, one thing we should mention is uh, we're taking questions as we go, so feel free to send questions into the chat, and uh, we'll be answering those at the end. Uh, one question that did come in that we can talk about real quickly before we get to the Nexus Go is uh, what happens if the unit were to lose power, if you suddenly lost your batteries and you were recording? Uh, can you recover the recording off of the unit? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So um, all our uh, recording products from sound devices for many, many years have always had sort of like a, a fail safe system um, whereby the headers of the um, actual WAV files or dot mic files that are being recorded are continually updated. So if there is a full pull of the batteries literally drop out mid recording, you will not lose the whole recording. You may lose the last few seconds, uh, but really nothing more than that. Okay. All right. So we're going to now switch to the other new product which we released. Um, and this might be familiar to some users who are, who are watching right now. Um, we've, um, you know, last year, was it last year? I can't remember when we, we released the A20 Nexus, which yeah, was, was a... Uh, <laughs> was the end of November last year. I yeah. can't remember now. It's time runs so quickly. <laughs> but yeah, we released the, the Nexus, which was uh, an eight-channel, uh, multi-channel wireless digital receiver, which could be up, expanded up to 16 channels. And we've had many people reach out uh, to us, say, look, we really are looking for a, a, a more bag-specific solution, something that, you know has all that wonderful technology that the you know the astral nexus system has introduced but something more predominantly for the bag and you know uh, most bag users you know if you look at the statistics really we're looking at probably on average around three maybe four channels 
for most jobs. Yeah, occasionally there's a need to go to six and on really rare occasions, maybe up to eight. But in the main, three or four channels is sort of like caters to uh, a, the largest proportion of bag use cases. So we brought out um, last week the A20 Nexus Go which is a, a half rack one new uh, system, which is designed um, to really sit very nicely in a bag because of its compact size. It's really exactly the same form factor as a A20 Nexus. Um, and again, it can be docked directly to any eight series uh, via an expansion port uh, on the underside of the Nexus. Um, and so, that's what we call the quick dock yeah, accessory. Yes, quick dock, and you can see sort of like it actually here, we've got these levers here where you squeeze them in and then release this catch and then you can just pull the system off and to install, it's just the opposite operation. Yeah. Really quick to do. You do want to make sure to power the unit down before yeah. you dock and undock. Yeah, uh, absolutely. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it really integrates beautifully with the 8 Series in a bag. And um, of course, you can still use the A20 Nexus Go with other third party systems, but obviously you would use the audio outputs on the rear of the A20 Nexus Go, which we'll talk about in a minute. We've got digital outputs and analog outputs. So quick summary of the A20 Nexus Go again, it has all the same core technology as the A20 Nexus. The primary difference is, uh, so let, let's say what that is, that spectra band, which we've already gone over when we're talking about the A20 TX, that's the huge, uh, 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 range, a uh, tuning range from 169 megahertz up to 1525 megahertz. You've got the next link uh, control, remote control of your transmitters. Um, you've got gain forward support. So you've got all of this wonderful um, technology in here. We've got the built in real time spectrum analyzer, which I can show you very quickly. Here it is. There it is, um, a real-time spectrum analyzer, which is uh, once you start using something like this, you'll never go back. You have the auto-assign capability where you can tap anywhere and on the screen and then hit OK, and it's going to automatically find clean frequencies for you and essentially program them into the receiver channels and then send those same frequencies to your other transmitters. So that's all fantastic. Um, all right, and then um, we've got um, on top of that, so yeah, they're, they're, the, they're the key technologies. Now, the main differences between this and a, and a full A20 Nexus is that as standard, this is four channel, okay, as opposed to the eight channel of an A20 Nexus. And that four channel is gonna serve most people in a bag very well. However, we do allow the capability to expand it for those who are, need those extra channels. Um, so you can expand in uh, with two channel expansion licenses. So you can take it up to six channel, or if you buy two of those expansion licenses, up to eight channel. Uh, you can either buy permanent licenses um, or you can rent licenses. So we see many people, um, you know, typically using no more than three or four channels. And then maybe once or twice a year, they made it another couple of channels, in which case you can actually rent a two channel expansion license and, and rent another two channels and to take the unit up to six channels. And you can rent that uh, for a seven day period or a 30 day period. So there's a lot of flexibility there. Um, OK, so that's obviously a key difference between the A20 Nexus Go and the A20 Nexus. The other big thing is because this is primarily aimed at bag work, not that it couldn't be used on a, on a cart as well, but because this is primarily used on a bag, there is no network connectivity. So there's no Dante. Um, the A20 Nexus has Dante. There's no Dante. There's no web control via Ethernet, network control. And there's no, obviously, power over Ethernet. So you, you don't, if, if those features are important to you, in the work you do, you should really be looking at the A20 Nexus. But if your main work is within a bag, then the Nexus Go is an absolutely perfect solution for that. Anything to add on that, Gary? No, I mean, uh, I've got a 
slide up here that we can show you that just gives you an overview of the back panel oh, yeah. of this. That's so uh, this. when you see this, it'll be obvious as to what the changes are here. So it's the same DB25 for your up to eight channels for uh, outputs. That's mic, line, or AES out. You've still got uh, BNC connections on the front and the back. Uh, as with the A20 Nexus, that allows you to connect antennas to either side. Or there's a cascade option where you can connect uh, antennas to the front and then cascade out the back if you need to feed into additional wireless equipment. You still got the 2.4 gigahertz antennas because we still have the next link yeah, connection. On, on the BNC, I think we should also say we uh, support active antennas and smart antennas like the Wizicom LFA. Yeah, the support for the smart antennas on the Nexus Go is identical to the uh, A20 Nexus. Yep. Uh, and then we've still got the DC power output options and you've got a uh, time code input here for jamming time code. So all of that is, is still on the back. As you mentioned, what's uh, not here is the network connections. Uh, a redundant power input, and then the additional audio outputs required for the higher channel count on the Nexus. Right, yeah. So just talking about the uh, the uh, BNC for time code and word clock on the back there, we can send that time code to our transmitters via Nextlink. Yeah, so and that works with A20 Mini or with A20T. Correct, yeah. Okay, so um, what else can we talk about here? So yeah, we've, we've gone over the main differences. Um, I think it might be worth reiterating a little bit about, well, we can, I think it's worth reiterating a little bit about the tuning bands. Sure. Gary, do you want to talk about those again? Yeah, so I can show you on here. Uh, as you're getting to a new location, and uh, in fact, I think we have a question later on about how quickly can I set up my system at a new location. Uh, what I tend to do is go into my RTSA view and immediately go into my scan view. Uh, and so now that'll stop audio. And this is a scan. In this case, I'm looking at my entire UHF TV band for the United States. So that's 470 to 616, and that's shown across here. You'll see some color coding across the bottom that shows you available tuning bands. Uh, and Should we show them what the full yeah, one go gig? For, go for okay. it. <laughs> you can actually, um, let's see. Oh, no, it's not this one here. You can actually sort of like zoom out. Uh, oh, not one, this one here. Yep. So zoom in or zoom out to various parts of the spectrum, okay? okay. But if you go fully anti-clockwise on this code on this encoder, yep. you can now see the full one six nine to one five two five megahertz. And, and it's going to take a, st <laughs> a second to step through all those different tuning bands and stitch yep. it all together. But again, you'll see all the different areas that you can uh, have available to you. Uh, it, another way to do what you're showing is also just to use the arrows in the top corner here. Yep. So as I tap through. It's going to scroll to different areas. So let's say, for example, that I want to try uh, what we in the US call the duplex gap, 653 to 663. I can just click on that now from the scan, and it changes my tuning band to 653 to 663. Uh, in the area that we're operating in, there's really nothing in the duplex gap right now. So if I wanted to move my three transmitters into this region, all I'd have to do is click on my encoder and click Auto Assign. It's going to allow me to limit this range if I want to. Uh, I don't have to. It's up to me if I want to tune that entire 10 megahertz tuning band or not. I'm going to hit OK. And it's going to analyze the cleanest frequencies available. It's going to assign three frequencies. And you're going to see that it's going to instantly tune all three of my transmitters to go into this tuning band. So I did it kind of slowly to show you the operation, but this is a less than one minute sort of thing to reach something that would previously take you about half an hour minimum <laughs> depending on um, your setup yeah yeah and the fact that you know we have all of these tuning bands which have real great immunity from outside influence talk about saw film yeah that's a, a great point so in this case uh this happens to be a 10 megahertz tuning band because of our local regulations uh but most of the tuning bands and i'll go to one of the tuning bands in uhf tv here most of the tuning bands are around 24 megahertz so here is an example of a 24 megahertz tuning band. There we go. And this one, uh, you can see there's a digital TV station in there. Uh, oh, I picked the wrong one, didn't I? Oh, I demo. There we go. So 24 megahertz tuning band. You can see a couple of microphones on in that uh, region, probably stuff people are testing around the office. But uh, same thing in here. If I wanted to find three frequencies, I can just go auto assign all and hit OK. And it's going to look at what those other microphones are that are in operation. It's going to find me three good frequencies, and it's going to turn on my three microphones in this tuning band. So it's really just that quick 
can go between different tuning bands. And then each one of these tuning bands, as Paul mentioned, in on the front end, which between the antenna and the receiver, there's what we call a soft filter. Uh, soft filter is a very, very selective RF filter. It's got very steep roll off outside of that soft filter's 24 megahertz operating range. And so if you have strong signals outside of the range, for example, I picked uh, 470 to 494. Below 470 in the United States is two-way radios. And those are generally stronger transmitting signals, maybe one watt, three watt, two-way radios. Uh, so the soft filter helps to reject all of the interfering signals that might be just outside of this tuning band and gives you more reliable operation in mm -hmm. this band. And that's true for all of the different tuning bands that you're going to select on the Nexus or the Nexus Go. Perfect. Thanks, Gary. Yeah. So, yeah, you can see how simple this uh, interface is on the Nexus Go. Same as the Nexus. It's all touch operated, very easy to navigate. Um, and, you know, you can make many settings. You can come into any any channel here and um, you know change your rf power on the fly your mode modulation one of my favorite new things is the gear menu where you can actually get into all of the settings for the a20 tx right from here by going to the more button yeah and so most of the common settings that you would get to from the menu on the a20 tx are also available right on your receiver right and it all syncs up automatically via next link so it really minimizes the amount you, you can obviously still use the uh user interface on the A20TX if you'd like, but everything's available on the Nexus as well. Right. Uh, for those, very quickly, for those uh, people out there who are familiar with the A20 Nexus, we've obviously released a firmware update um, simultaneously at the launch of the Nexus Go, which also adds features and improvements to the standard Nexus uh, version 1.50. Um, and one of the nice uh, improvements here is the TX list itself. And uh, so, you know, just showing you that again, here's our main menu. If you tap TX list, essentially what the TX list is, is an inventory of all your transmitters. Um, you know, the first thing you do when you set up one of these systems is you essentially pair your transmitters to the Nexus. Uh, it's like a one-off uh, sort of, need to do it once you've got your transmitters paired you never really need to do it ever again and it's essentially like a, a massive inventory of all your transmitters and you can select which ones that you want to use for a partic particular job so you can see here i've got three transmitters paired boom gary and paul and right now they're assigned to receiver channels one two and three on a particular job if i actually only needed two for instance i could just assign Paul to nothing and it's not going to be used and I could power it down and, and not use it. Um, so we also, it, you can see we've actually changed and improved the layout of the TX list here. So now we're actually showing the transmitters battery uh, remaining uh, runtime here from this one consolidated place, which really helps when you can scroll this list. And then we're also showing the next link status. Um, there's been uh, some improvements here too. So you can see that um, uh, whether you've got good connection here to your transmitters, the number of bars, five bars is, is great connection, four is still good, but sort of slightly getting less, three bars is slightly less, two bars are less and so forth. Now, if it's green, that means you're, and you've got five bars, it means your transmitters on, and it's getting great uh, connection with via Nextlink. If it goes white, um, well, let's just do this now. I'm going to turn all the transmitters off via our global power all transmitters off uh, control here. Um, you'll see that the Nextlink icon goes white. So that means that we you still have good um, connection, uh, Nextlink connection, but that just the transmitters are off. And then we can see here the frequency of the transmitters as well. So that's all in one place. All right. Now, the nice thing as well, the other change we made is that even the tra transmitters that are not m mapped to any channel, to a receive, actual receive channel, like in the case of Paul here, I can still make settings to that transmitter via the TX view. Uh, so these are just transmitter related from. So I can pre-set up my transmitter without having it actually uh, mapped to or assigned to a receive channel. You can, in the TX list, you can have up to 64 um, paired 
neurotransmitters, which should be enough for, for most um, applications. Well, I think we've probably covered the majority of uh, the features here. We should open up to some more questions, I think. Sure, that sounds great. Uh, one of the things, let's see, I'll go to my questions list. Uh, there was a question about Bluetooth control uh, and the transmit power for Bluetooth control. Uh, I do want to mention that uh, Bluetooth is really going to be used for communication between an A20 Mini or an A20 TX and your iOS or Android device when you're running the A20 remote app. Yep. Uh, so that's BLE, uh, Bluetooth Low Energy, which is generally 10 milliwatts or less. Uh, for really long range control, obviously we've been talking about Nextlink, and I think Nextlink is what you want to use for uh, extended distance control. Uh, we we have got a surprising number of questions. I think about AES forty two. There are a lot of super cement users out there who want to use mm -hmm. AES forty two. Uh, can you talk a little bit about uh, the channel that you mentioned earlier that we can send one over? Sure, uh, can, the, the wireless. We can link? actually demonstrate this because I think it's a lot better to do that, don't you? Yeah. Uh, so I'm just plugging in this super cement just here, and. And then we can go to the audio input menu. Well, we can either do this from the menu of the um, A20TX or the Nexus. I'll do it from the actual A20TX itself here. So again, open the door, press your menu. And then if you come down to your audio menu here and select that, you can see all the various like input types. And as you can see, I've selected, um, this is fun thing, obviously lab is a lapel mic, mic is a balanced mic input line is balanced line p48 is for balanced mics with uh, that require 48 volts and then you've got also a phantom 12 volt phantom option as well here but here's our as42 which is what you'd select if you are running with the super cmit when you select this it opens up a sub menu and there you can choose which channel you want to transmit so the uh, channel one is your process signal i believe and channel two is your unprocessed signal. So you can choose which one you want to send. Now, as we alluded to just before, we are evaluating right now, adding a feature that regardless of which channel you're, you're transmitting, we're evaluating the possibility of allowing both channels to be recorded to the micro SD card. So, that's nice if, you know, for instance, you sent the transmitted the process signal and then post production at a later st st stage said, you know, we would actually like the raw unprocessed version of it. You will have that on the micro SD card and you'll be able to send it, send that to them. OK. All right. We've got a couple of questions about uh, VHF. So we did mention that the A20 mini hardware uh, is not capable of VHF. So it's A20 TX that does VHF. Uh, and then also the, the Monarch antenna, which we've got an example here of, this is the uh, A20 Monarch antenna. You do get two of these with a Nexus or a Nexus Go, uh, and they come with the, the clamp for it. Mm -hmm. uh, these antennas are 470 to 1525. So if you are doing VHF, you're going to need a different accessory antenna. Uh, the A20 TX comes with a long antenna that you can cut down for the whip antenna. As well as three other as antennas. Well as other antennas for the yeah. UHF band. Uh, so that's what you do for a VHF. Do you want to talk about belt clip accessory as well? Uh, I don't think right now. Okay. Uh, the Oh, here's a good question. So you touched a little bit about uh, the advantages of a Nexus versus uh, a slot, one of our slot receivers. But specifically, uh, if you've got an SL2, and two A twenty RX versus a Nexus Go. What are your main uh, similarities and differences? All right. So, if you're, you know, if you um, are wanting to use your A twenty RX, this will su support the well. It does support Spectra Band now. We will, in a in a firmware update, quite soon, um, extend the Spectra Band range via a firmware update to VHF as well. Um, so it has full spectra band support. It has your gain forward support, as we've already mentioned. You know, these are two channel digital uh, wireless receivers. So if you're using with a CL2, uh, and sorry, an SL2, a CL2, totally different product. <laughs> uh, 
uh, then you're going to have a maximum of four channels. So that's definitely a, vi a totally viable um, solution for a bag, and it's going to uh, cater to many applications. If you never see yourself ever going beyond four, which many users won't, then that's a great system. Um, however, if you see yourself as someone who really likes the idea of the remote control from your receiver to your transmitter, so the next link capability, then the Nexus Go is absolutely for you because this does not have the next link support. And also, I'd say if you ever see um, even if it's just maybe once or twice a year, the need for more than four channels and you just want the confidence that your system can accommodate that, the Nexus is a, is a great way forward because via those software expansion licenses, you can either rental or permanent licenses, you can add those channels. So, yeah. Yeah, I think uh, and, the, and, and, the RTSA and the, as the well. The RTSA is yeah. a very big thing as well, which I was just about to get to. Uh, you know, to run an, an RTSA piece of hardware in your bag, uh, which would, number one, it would be super messy, <laughs> gonna need a whole bunch of other cables to make that happen and it wouldn't be reliable. This is an ultra low noise, really high quality RCSA. Um, you, you're gonna be looking at several thousand dollars to get an equivalent system. And the fact that this is integrated into Nexus and you can assign directly from the RTSA, as Gary just did there, <laughs> It just really changes and improves your, your, your whole experience on set. It removes a, a massive part of the stress of your day. And those people who've, who've worked with that with the A20 Nexus, there's no turning back. Yeah. So I mean, I find myself, in, even in the single channel view, pulling up the RTSA on the last screen mm -hmm. and you can watch all of your channel metrics like your signal strength in blue here, your Q meter in purple and then also be watching your carrier on here and see if there's anything close by. You can easily tap into it and see the entire right. RTSA. So, uh, and that's available, I think we should mention, that's also available here in the four channel view, you can bring up a R RTSA yeah. on the third screen. Yeah. So, you know, if, so you can make your decision based on, the, on those things. And the other thing to throw into this uh, questions you have to ask yourself is, do you ever see yourself doing some sort of remote type work where or high channel count work, then maybe instead of the Nexus Go, you should be looking at the full A20 Nexus as well, because that supports up to 16 channels, has web app control, it has Dante, and it has this PoE, power over ethernet capability. So I would say if you're a bag user, Nexus Go or A20 RX are the two things you should be looking at. But if you want all that backlink RTSA sort of stuff, then the Nexus Go is for you. Um, if you do go through to the A20 RX as your solution via the SL2, then you still have A20 remote as an option for controlling your and setting up your transmitters. So it's not that you lose your wireless remote control of your transmitters. It's just nowhere near as convenient as Nextlink and assigning frequencies and all of that stuff that we've just shown. Yeah, uh, we've got a question here about how many channels uh, can you have with the new A20TX? Uh, I think that's, that's probably related to what you were talking about, Paul, with the transmitter lists. We've expanded the transmitter list functionality now, so you can have up to 64 transmitters yep. uh, on the next link with either a Nexus or a Nexus Go. And then uh, we have another question about multiple channels, which kind of ties into that. So you can assign multiple transmitters to a single receive channel now if you need to. Mm -hmm. And so then you would, as a user, manually turn one on or off, but you can have them both linked up. And so that when either one of them is on, then that uh, the transmitter that's turned on is being controlled by that receiver channel on your Nexus. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about uh, Digital noise, we get a lot of questions about uh, digital noise getting into microphones. I think this is a common question with, with boom mics. Uh, the accessory cable that we sell that goes from Limo to XLR does have a built-in RF filter, so that can give you 40 dB of noise reduction with an RF filter. But there certainly are some microphones out there that are susceptible to noise from digital transmitters, and that's really not unique to uh, an A20TX or an A10TX. This would be any digital wireless transmitter. 
So if you ha you were going to want to check to see, I know, for example, Sennheiser, they had a change with some of their shotgun mics where they improved the RF filtering. So an older Sennheiser mic might, you hear some of that digital noise in the microphone and the new ones now are much more noise uh, immune because of improved RF shielding. So that's just something I think users are going to want to be aware of and maybe test out if you're thinking about moving to any kind of a digital transmitter. All right. Uh, Paul, can you talk a little bit about the reception and uh, signal reliability? The question is, is A20 TX uh, better than A20 Mini in terms of uh, reception reliability? The same thing is A20 RX better or worse than Nexus and the different modulation schemes there? No, essentially um, any combination of the A20 products, whether it's A20 Mini, A20 TX, A20 Nexus, A20 Nexus Go, A20 RX, you can use these in <laughs> any sort of combination and get the same performance in terms of range and, and robustness of your RF signal. Um, and even the old <laughs> legacy A10 TX supports the modulation schemes of the A20 system. So we have two modulation schemes um, for our digital wireless. We have standard modulation and long range modulation. Um, really, the primary difference is that long range gives you, well, standard gives you good range and long range gives you like incredibly um, long range. Um, and, and in our tests, our the range of our wireless um, is as good, if not better than anything that's out there. Um, we have a range of RF power selections. So you've got two milliwatt, 10 milliwatt, 20 milliwatt, and 40 milliwatt. And obviously the higher the RF power, the more range, but you know. And that's the same on both A20 mini and, and A20 TX. Exactly. Yep. Um, and you know, w for the majority of applications, you're you know, the sweet spot is probably 10 milliwatts in terms of getting sort of great range and good battery runtime. Um, if you're really pushing the range, uh, 20 milliwatt is going to handle 99.9% .9 of those. 40 milliwatt, yes, you can go to that if you want. Um, you, you're you're going to be burning up obviously a bit more battery runtime with that. So, you know, it's always recommended, especially with digital, to go with the lowest RF power that you can for the range you require, rather than pushing a huge amount of RF into the environment. Yeah, I think that's just generally good practice, isn't it, Gary? Yeah, I would say something I end up talking to users about is, you know, going from 20 milliwatt to 40 milliwatt is only 3 dB more power. Uh, and you could go from a omnidirectional antenna to a directional antenna and that could give you 6 dB yeah. more signal. So a lot of times, if you're really trying to get maximum range, looking at your antenna system is going to be a bigger advantage uh, going with perhaps an amplified antenna if you've got long coaxial cable. There are a number of different things. It, look at your system as a whole. Uh, the trade-off for battery runtime versus higher power beyond that 20 or 40 milliwatt setting uh, tends to not be a huge improvement. Right. And it's worth noting the advantages of digital over analog wireless at this point. A digital system is able to decode a signal with much less signal to noise. Um, typically, I mean, it, it's going to vary, but, you know, a, 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 an analog system may, may need around 30, 35 dBs of, of signal to noise, whereas with our systems, it's sort of like 20 approximately, that sort of level, and being able to fully decode a signal. Yeah. Uh, kind of following on with that, we had a question about uh, the standard modulation versus long-range modulation and output power. Uh, the if Output power is output power, so 10 milliwatt in, in long-range versus 10 milliwatt in uh, standard is going to be the same amount of output power. As Paul mentioned, you may get longer range with the long-range modulation given the same output power, uh, so that could be an advantage for you. It could also be... Uh, give you the opportunity to turn the power down with long range mode to get better battery life the, and have similar distance. I mean, this would be our recommendation. Um, the only real difference between standard, uh, apart from the range, the standard and the long range modulation is latency. Both offer really good low latency. The latency of standard mode is around two milliseconds. Um, for long range, it's 3.9 milliseconds. Both of those are more than low enough, 
low enough, which is totally suitable for the type of application that we're dealing with here, production sound. So um, really, we would recommend just leaving it on long range modulation um, and only in those really rare circumstances where you need that ultra, ultra low uh, latency, then select standard. OK, uh, we've got a question here just generally about uh, compatibility. Uh, and the thing to note is all of the sound devices, wireless products have this long range modulation. They have standard modulation. And in that sense, they're completely interoperable. Yep. If you have an older A10 system, the tunable range may be a little bit less than a newer A20 system, but all of the systems can work uh, yeah, with mean, each other given the yeah, same frequency bands. And the, A20, so, the A10TX is still a great transmitter and it will have the same range as uh, an A20TX or A20 mini running the same modulation, you know, the same power, the yeah. same power. Absolutely. So you're it's still a great transmitter. Obviously, you don't have that spectra band. You don't have the next link. You don't have all of these really cool tools. But yeah. in terms of, of everything but, else. But they are all compatible with yeah, each other. Exactly. Yeah. Um, one thing we wanted to talk about quickly with the boom mic is we have an A boom accessory. Uh, a, the A boom accessory works with our A10 transmitter. And so uh, coming soon will be an A Boom, Boom 2. 2. Correct. And so I've got a picture of the A Boom 2 up here that we can show briefly. Uh, what we've got on the uh, A20 transmitter is just a couple of screw holes. And so you can screw the, the new A Boom 2 directly to the uh, And it can be either way. It can be inverted. So it's, yeah, that's and right. it's actually horizontal as well. So here's the other, <laughs> here's the other view here. You can uh, turn it sideways if you'd like. So there's two different ways to do it. So that'll be available as an accessory very soon. Cool. All right. Uh, other questions here? Let's see. Uh, oh, are, are channels five through eight available at launch? Uh, yes, they are. So yep. the A20 Nexus Go uh, ships with four channels, but you are able to expand it to six or eight channels with a software expansion license. That's available right now. Uh, the question about pricing. Head to store.sounddevices.com and you can look at all of the mm -hmm. different options there for both rental and permanent licenses. Let's see. Uh, and then, uh, oh, uh, is there an international version of the A20TX? Uh, so, yes, if you purchase an A20TX outside of the United States, that will authenticate as an international version. And that'll allow you to do uh, record and transmit simultaneously for uh, certain applications. And then, uh, Paul, can you talk a little bit about power consumption for A20 Nexus and A20 Nexus Go? Is there a difference in power consumption? I think they're probably consider, uh, thinking about docking on an 8 series. Right. OK, so, you know, roughly we're looking at um, you know, in, 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 in idle mode with um, maybe just a couple of receive channels on or four channels on around somewhere between 10 watts and 11 watts, I think, okay. for the four channel use there. Same on same on the Nexus as well, the full Nexus. But obviously, if you've got other things in operation like Dante and right. a lot more channels, then you're going to obviously consume a bit more power. But yeah, I would say... Um, in standard configuration on your Nexus, go around 10 watts. And that all the power, if you're using with your 8 series, you'll plug your power into your 8 series TA4 input. And the power for the Nexus Go will come via the expansion port and come from there. Yeah. Uh, you can see your power. Um, you've got a power menu where you can see the actual voltage level coming through there. Um, and, you know, that, you know, if you have got um, peripherals connected to your DC outputs on your Nexus Go, then obviously you're going to be drawing more power through the system. Right. Yeah, and I think it's important to note that, you know, obviously we're very conscious about power consumption. So if you're looking at the spec sheet, that's going to give you uh, power consumption with all the different things on. But as we're not using certain parts of the receive system or um, in the case of the A20 Nexus, if we're not using Dante or the network capability, as those parts of the system shut off, we're not sending power to them. So the power consumption very much scales with what functions of the receiver that you're using. Yeah. All right, we are catching up on all of our different questions. Uh, if That's you've got great. 
more questions, please uh, send them in. And in the in the meantime, is there anything uh, else that we uh, need to talk about? Well, let's just uh, took a little a bit more about actually this. I think is going to be a very common configuration. An eight three three with an eight three three or an eight 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 with a Nexus Go. Um, it's you know. <laughs> Um, they're, they're sort of like ideal size, they're like almost like exactly the same size, so it fits beautifully in a bag. Um, you know, if this is a standard four channel, you've got obviously enough uh, ISO channel support with your 833. Um, even if you expand the um, the Nexus to a full, the Nexus go to a full eight channels, you've got that as standard with your um, 833. So that's a real nice touch. Um, when you're um, in this configuration, uh, you can see that the 8 series, let's actually just talk about this quick. You need to select your Nexus Go outputs to route them to each channel. So if you go to a channel screen on your 8 series, in this case, channel 1, I can scroll through that and then I can go to the channel source menu and either select, select standard sort of balanced mic line sources, but then you have this A20 Nexus option here. And currently I've got A20 Nexus select channel one selected here. Now, obviously if I had two of the expansion licenses for A20 Nexus installed, then I'd see eight uh, A20 Nexus Go sources here. So there's that. And when you select um, a Nexus source for your eight series channel, um, notice that the name of the transmitter that you've got routed to your Nexus Go receiver channel is rippled through from the receiver, from the, from the, tr from the uh, transmitter itself to the receiver channel that it's assigned to, and then from there directly to your eight series. So you only ever have to um, change your name in one place. Let me just show an example. I've got Gary on channel two here. So if I come here and edit, um, Gary, say, let's just change that to Gary one, for instance. So that's going to, on this transmitter here, if I just move that here, change that to save that. So that should update to Gary one there. It's updated to Gary one here. And you can see now in my eight series, it's set to Gary one. So this just makes the whole um, name management super easy. And that information is obviously stored in the recorded file so that post-production can see all that information. All right, we do have one more question, okay. uh, just about r remote powering. So can you show just the power on off? I think you did show during the demo the power everything on and off. Oh. Uh, what are your other options for powering and maybe just you know, walk them through the remote control one more time. Okay, so we're talking, uh, let's just come to the main screen here. So if you wanna look at a specific transmitter, in this case, Gary One, I'm going to tap on Gary One and now I've got all the controls that uh, I can set uh, for the transmitter and the receive channel from this one screen. Although there are extra screens under that gear menu, which is here in this screen. So yeah, of course, from here, I can turn off a transmitter and you can see now it's turned off here. Um, I can turn it on, back on. And obviously this can be done over huge distances without any problem. Um, we can mute transmitters here so you can see the mute icon there and as soon as I do that the audio um, uh, metering LED turns blue that's a useful feature if you want to mute someone when they want a bit of privacy uh, yeah, it's you... kind of a flashing green when it uh, senses audio yeah and then when you mute it it just turns a solid blue thank you and then you've got like an ID function which is pretty useful if you've got many of these uh, transmitters and you want to identify a unit whether it's on or off you hit ID and you can see which transmitters you're talking to uh, by virtue of the fact that they're flashing the IDs here, the, the LEDs. Um, and then if you want to turn your LEDs off because you want to be in like a, 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 a an invisible sort of state so that you don't you know have your LEDs shine onto a camera or coming through clothing, you can turn LEDs off there. Uh, we can set RF power from here. So let's just turn this on here. I can turn, I can turn my RF entirely off if I want to. And you can see the signal's gone. I can say turn, select any RF power from here. These are our overload indicators coming on. 
Yeah, um, amber just means you're approaching overload, and it's because yeah. we're you know six so inches away from the end. The end. nice thing about this control, obviously, is if you're starting to get dropouts because the talent has moved well out of range, you can then sort of st still increase the RF power from here to bring them back into the range, which is a useful tool. And here, where you can tap the um, the frequency button here and program manually a different frequency if you need to. Yeah, if you're in an environment where <clears throat> frequencies are assigned to you, you can just directly dial the frequency. Right, and you can turn a receive channel off there. Notice we've got the RF history here. Uh, we've got the RSSI meters, which showing the signal level coming in, and we've got a Q meter, which indicates the quality of the signal, and also an RF history plot, which can be set to either show the RSSI uh, uh, levels or the Q levels. You, do you want to go over Q yeah. again quickly? And the, and the dip there is just showing you where you turned the RF signal off. Yep. But yeah, Q meter is very helpful with the digital transmitter because it essentially tells you signal to noise. The link quality is really what a Q meter is. So right. uh, you could have a strong interfering signal uh, that is underneath your existing transfer. Right now we're tra uh, transmitting on 474, 625. If we happen to have an inter interfering signal on 474, 625, our A and B signal strength indicators here, the blue meters might stay full, but our Q meter would start to drop as it senses that there's an interfering signal that's right on frequency with mm -hmm. the, the signal that we're trying to decode. And so that's a, a just a safer, right. uh, better indication of uh, how Good your link quality is and tells you when you might want to think about changing frequencies right uh, a couple of other things here if you tap i'll just do that again if i tap this sort of battery next link button here um it, it, it will bring up the uh, a list of all the transmitters in the tx list so if you want to quickly party dial in a different transmitter you can uh, the current one that's routed to this receive channel is shown by this next link icon down here so that's a really quick way of selecting a different transmitter for the same receive channel. Um, obviously, you've got your modulation, which you can change here. Um, now, then you've got your mode switch. So if I want to go to record only, notice that when I set this to be a record only transmitter, the layout changes slightly here. We've now got this record uh, on and off function just here. So I can put the unit into record. Um, and you can see you've got like a little record icon there. And I've got my LEDs turned off right now. So if the LEDs are turned on, um, which will happen hopefully very, very soon. <laughs> um, so, okay, here we go. Okay. So you can see, um, whoops, if I just show, there you go. No, no that's, that's where I want to be. <laughs> there you go. Go, go the other way. There you go. Oh, yeah. Here we go. You can see that yep. LED come on. The camera's behind me. Get that pull. Yeah. Um, all right. So, yeah, the, the layout changes depending on what mode you're in. And obviously, if you're in an international market, um, you can have record uh, plus um, transmit tr transmit simultaneous option. Okay. So, just looking at a few other functions here, um, we've got this gear menu, which is where we put some of the features which are you need to adjust much less often. So, you can come in there. Um, I can see the name of the channel that I'm working with right now. You've got uh, just a little display of the next link status to so you know where you stand with the next link command. You've got a various uh, options here. The first option here at the top there is auto power with Limo connection. So that's nice. It's a useful feature that will automatically, when you unplug a Limo connection, will uh, turn it off. Da da da, as you can see there. And when you plug in, it will automatically turn on. So that saves a, a step, you know, every morning. Just plug in your lab and it will automatically turn on, okay? Uh, the other option down here is resume record upon powering on. So yeah, if you are in a, a record workflow, um, then um, this just saves you having, once you power on uh, after lunch or the next morning, if you were recording, it will just automatically resume recording. Uh, let's take a look at um, the other page here, this more page. And um, now if a lav is plugged in, it'll automatically select it. But if I don't have um, a lav, I can select um, various types of balance sources, whether mic line phantom or AS or AS42 or AS3. 
Um, right. Just yeah, and we went through most of this menu before yeah. when we All talked right. about uh, the different uh, features that we can change from here. So all right, it's good enough. Any think, other questions? Yeah, on we are about caught up on questions. So Perfect. I think that, and we're a little over an hour in, so I think that's about it for us. We'll okay, so wrap it up. If there's no other questions, which there aren't, which is good. Um, thank you very much for listening. Obviously, um, if you want more information, you can either call your resellers, you can call us and tech support. You can go to our website where you can, you know, find out all the information you need, including including um, pricing. Uh, but, you know, uh, speak to your local reseller. They can give you a, the lowdown as well. Um, any information about the two channel expansion licenses can be found online as well. Um, all information about the rental and the permanent licenses is there. Um, we are recording this, so we will send out a link uh, very shortly so you can review anything in this. Um, and we've if you're you know specifically interested in the the nexus go there's already a whole bunch of videos uh, online in our video section online which were made for the a20 nexus but a lot of them do apply to the a20 nexus go so go there yeah so check out our youtube channel for yeah, the check out the uh, youtube channel videos. for that and then yeah that's it you can always call our tech support line as well or email them or do whatever you like so many ways to find out more um, a good place right. to start is sounddevices.com slash support. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. All right. Thanks, everybody. Take care.